Hello and welcome to I'd Like to Know. Pastor Stephen Bohr, Pastor C.A. Murray here, and we're here to answer your questions. That's what I'd Like to Know is all about. You send us the questions, we dig out the answers, and together we learn of the Word of God and God's will for our lives. Uh, I hasten to say, should you like to participate, uh, should you like to be part of the question and answer part of this program, then we would invite you to uh, go to the website or send your questions in to l questions. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, we can read. No, it's live. Um, TV. TV at sometv.org. Some my mind just, <laughs> this is live TV, and my mind just <laughs> took a vacation in the hallway. Uh, TV at sometv.org. Uh, those are the, that's the, the uh, address that you want to send your questions to, and I apologize for that. Um, a lot of things are going on in my head here. But we enjoy answering your questions, and we enjoy the time that we spend together. So send your questions in, tv at sumtv.org, and we will do our very best to answer your questions. Now, um, Pastor, we've got some good questions today. We do. Uh, we've got some really good questions, uh, kind of went us, sent us digging and um, by the grace of God, we can answer these questions. We'll have a word of prayer, and then let's launch out and, and go right to it. Let's go for it. Father God, again, we praise you and thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We thank you that your word can be studied, and that when we do study, we are enriched and ennobled and drawn closer to you. Bless us today as we seek to follow your will, answer these questions, and inform ourselves and our viewers of what your will is for our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, CA, right. we've got uh, five questions, and I'm sure we're not going to be able to cover all of them. <laughs> we have not yet so far, yep. so I doubt if we'll do so today. Very, very good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first one. Evolutionists say that dinosaurs are proof of evolution. How do we respond? Did dinosaurs exist before the flood? Did God create them? And why do they not exist today? Mm. So it's a series of questions all related one to another. Yes. So what can we say about uh, dinosaurs, these huge animals that have been discovered, fossils have been discovered? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the fossil record shows that they did exist. Something did exist because we, we see the remnants of them as we dig in the earth today. Large, very large animals, some very, very ferocious, um, that roam the earth. They do not exist today, and I thank the Lord that they don't, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, we, we have the proof that they were there. Um, were they part of evolution? Well, we believe in creation. All that is here, the Bible says, was made by Christ and was not, without him was not anything made that was made. So everything that exists came from the hand of God. So that does a number of things. It rules out evolution. Um, it does say that they were here. You know, when you look at the dinosaurs, and this is interesting, Pastor, when you look at the dinosaurs, they look like experiments. Mm-hmm. They look like experiments. You, you take uh, an animal like the Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, large head, very large, long legs, little short stubby hands that you can't really do anything. Terribly they look like ferocious. Terribly ferocious. Um, uh, and a very, very small brain uh, mm -hmm. for the size of head, for the size of the animal, uh, a relatively very, very small brain. So they look like someone was trying to do something. They look like experiments. Um, Ellen White tells us that everything that God made, all the animals that God made, were taken into the ark. I've got that quotation. You've got that? Yep. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to read it? Sure. Yeah. Volume 3 of Spiritual Gifts. Yes. Page 75. Mm -hmm. Every species of animal which God had created were preserved in the ark. The flood destroyed the confused species. Mm -hmm. She's talking about animals. Mm -hmm. The flood destroyed the confused species that God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, mm -hmm. what we might call today crossbreeding. Crossbreeding. She continues, since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, not man with beast, but of man 
and beast. Very, very important distinguish, uh, uh, distinction needs to be made. Amalgamation of man, amalgamation of beast. Right. Uh, man and beast does not mean man with beast. It means amalgamation in the human species, amalgamation in the animal world, not any cross between the two. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, God did not create all of the hundreds of breeds of dogs, for example. Oh, yes. Most of those are the result of genetic uh, manipulation. Mm -hmm. So I believe that God preserved in the ark. He didn't preserve 600 different species of dogs. Yeah. You know, he preserved the basic pair mm -hmm. that he created. Yes. That were not the result of crossbreeding, what Ellen White calls amalgamation. Mm -hmm. So she says, since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals. Yes. And in certain races of men. So we're not talking about crossbreeding human beings with animals, like some people have accused Ellen White. Yes. We're dealing with a human with human, yes. an animal with animal. An animal with animal, an animal with animal. Um, I have that same quote, actually mine is from Spirit of Prophecy, number one, uh, volume one, page 69, but it's the same quote because it appears mm -hmm. in a couple places. Uh, but it does tell us that um, there was amalgamation. Now, she also says, dealing with amalgamation, that amalgamation was one of the sins above another which caused the destruction of the race by the flood. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 it did a couple of things. One, amalgamation erased, defaced the image of God in man. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the animal kingdom also. Um, she said, that powerful, long-lived race, this is before the flood, had corrupted their ways before him. So one of the things that really uh, uh, worked against the image of God in, in the earth was this amalgamation. Man evidently, Pastor, as you well know, during those days, had great abilities. Of course, when you, mm -hmm. we can get into a lot of trouble living three score and ten. You have nine, six, seven, eight, nine, a thousand years to sort of hang around. Mm -hmm. You can, you can <laughs> get into a lot of devilment, yeah, yeah. you know. And, and, and you have a, a, a massive brain, you have great intelligence, and you have longevity to do some of these things. So mankind in playing, and she uses this term, uh, confusion, uh, that it confused mm -hmm. the people and... Uh, the confused species, as you just read, were not taken into the ark because mm -hmm. the Lord uh, did not want them. He did not make them. He did not create them. They were a product of man's maneuverings, so they weren't taken into the ark. Mm -hmm. And uh, she defines the amalgamation of humans as mixed marriages between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. And the daughters of men, of course, were the corrupt dis descendants of uh, Cain's mm -hmm. genealogy. Yes. And the sons of God were the descendants of Seth, mm -hmm. the righteous. Mm -hmm. Seems like when there's an intermingling of the righteous with the wicked, it not only affects uh, the mind, yes. but it also affects the physical nature. The physical nature. Because of all, all the habits mm -hmm. that uh, that worldling, so to speak, practice. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's sad, and, and of course we have counsel today uh, to, to, to marry, to choose to marry people who love the Lord, who are of, of the same mindset. Because when you put light with darkness, sadly in this world, darkness seems to triumph. Uh, and light does not seem to... Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. There, there are some times when uh, these things work out, but it's very, very seldom, and it's against wise counsel mm -hmm. uh, to marry uh, out of your faith, out of uh, your faith and belief systems. So here we have this... Um, uh, this amalgamation in the human... Now, I need to put this also, Pastor, because there have been some who have said uh, that when she talks about the amalgamation of, 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 of races, that there is a cursed race that came out of that. We need to sort of step back and disabuse sure, ourselves sure. of that idea because it's not biblical, it's not supported by the Bible or the writings of L.N.G. White, so we just want to sort of tap that and say that it's not something that... Um, we yeah, and, and that idea of the cursed race actually comes after the flood. Precisely. Uh, you, so, uh, you know, do, it doesn't have anything to do with mm -hmm. uh, the amalgamation of beast with beast and mm -hmm. man with man before the flood. Yeah. I have another couple of quotations here. Uh, one is from Spiritual Gifts, uh, Volume 3, page 92, where Ellen White wrote, Bones of men and animals are found in the earth, in mountains, and in valleys, uh -huh. showing that much larger men and beasts once lived upon the earth. I was shown that very large, powerful animals existed before the flood, which do not now exist. She gives the impression here that uh, 
perhaps there were some large animals that God created mm -hmm. that didn't survive the flood. And then there's another one. Uh, this one is in volume 4A of Spiritual Gifts, page 121. Mm -hmm. uh, she states, there was a class of very large animals which perished at the flood. God, and then she gives a reason. God knew that the strength of man would decrease. Yes. And these mammoth animals could not be controlled by feeble man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Of course, we, we, we have some general idea of, of the stature of Adam and Eve and, and the race of great men, men of renown who lived before the flood. And of course, once we, we began to eat meat and other kind of things that happened on the other side mm -hmm. of, of the flood, stature was uh, decrease, longevity was decreased, strength and moral vigor were decreased, uh, mental vigor was also decreased. So to try to wrestle with these giant creatures, uh, we couldn't do that successfully. So God in his mercy did not allow them to come in through. In fact, Ellen White stated that man before the flood had 20 times, yeah. Adam had 20 times mm -hmm. the vital energy that we have. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, and uh, of course the, evolution, <laughs> the evolutionary model is that as you go back, you have primitive man, mm -hmm. less intelligent, yes. more of a brute, mm -hmm. running around with stone hatchets, ki killing the dinosaurs, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, the Bible perspective is that the further back you go, yeah. the more vital energy Precisely. human beings have, the longer they live, yes. and the yes. more capacity they have. Yes. Imagine, imagine an individual working in a science lab for 900 years. Mm -hmm with 20 times the mental energy. <laughs> These people before the flood, yeah. you know, especially the wicked, mm -hmm. they, were, they were doing incredible things in the realm of genetics. Yeah, we have it totally upside down. The further you go back, the wiser and stronger man gets, not the weaker and dumber. Uh, right. They lived a long time. Well, they decided, let's build a tower that can reach to heaven. So they had the engineering skills to get that thing started and began building and God had to come down to confuse the languages mm -hmm. or the Bible says they could have done pretty much anything they wanted to do. So yep. they had the mental capacity to do these things. They weren't brute cavemen as you well said. Uh, these were smart, intelligent individuals who lived for l incredibly long periods of time and, and had great brains and great minds. Maybe I can read one more statement before we bring this particular uh, discussion to a close on this question. Uh, there also uh, was amalgamation of plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ellen White has this very interesting comment. It's uh, in Manuscript 65, pay, um, the year is 1899. And um, there's a parable of Jesus that touches upon this as well, the tares among the wheat. So this is how it reads. No, not one noxious, noxious means poisonous, mm -hmm. not one noxious plant was placed in the Lord's great garden but after Adam and Eve sinned, poisonous herbs sprang up. In the parable of the sower, the question was asked the master, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Mm. How then does it have tears? Yes. The master answered, an enemy has done this. Mm -hmm. And then she comments, all tares are sown by the evil one. Every noxious herb is of his sowing. And by his ingenious methods of amalgamation, he has corrupted the earth with tares. Yes. So uh, you even have, um, you know, plants that were uh, genetically modified. Yes, yes. Uh, to, to create uh, thorns and thistles and tares and yes. weeds mm -hmm. and things like that. It's inconceivable that God created a garden full of weeds. Full of weeds. <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. Well, we see this today, Pastor. Uh, you and I have traveled pretty extensively on planet Earth. There is a, a brand of corn here in the United States that is incredibly sweet. You know, corn on a cob. Mm -hmm. Very, very sweet. You don't, and it's, it's been genetically modified to be that sweet. Once you leave the United States, you don't find that sweet, sweet, sweet corn in other countries because they haven't done that. Right. It's a product of North America and our tastes have become accustomed to it to the extent that sometimes you go to countries and you find things that are not so sweet and you don't really like them because you've, your tastes have kind of been adulterated a little bit. But uh, uh, you can change, you can go from one thing to another thing, just a couple generations of breeding you can change or make a whole new dog or a whole new cat. Sure. You can breed out genetic qualifications that you don't like and breathe in things you do like uh, and you can totally change things. We do that all the time. Absolutely. So they did it back then also. Yeah, you know the dinosaurs were ugly creatures. Yes, yes. I mean ferocious creatures. Mm -hmm. It's uh, inconceivable 
when you look at their physiology, yes. that they were created by God. Yes. Because everything that God created was beautiful. Was beautiful, yeah. You get a thing with a head 10 or 12 feet long and teeth as long as your finger. That's mm -hmm. not something I want to be around. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, if you, if you don't believe that there was a worldwide flood, which most evolutionists do not believe that mm -hmm. there was a global flood, mm -hmm. Things get even more complicated because uh, they start talking about the different layers and the dinosaurs yes. on this layer, you know. So um, that the evolutionary model is just totally contradictory to the model that we find in yeah. Scripture. And the model in Scripture, if you really think about it, get your pride out of the way, it, it makes sense. It adds up. Right. The other model kind of flips things over and does not add up. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is this one. Does God have separate plans for the Jews and for the church? Does the church replace Israel as God's chosen people? It's known as replacement theology. Yes. And, um, you know, mainly this question probably was asked because uh, there are some individuals who believe in the rapture theory, mm -hmm. that God has a different plan for Israel and uh, uh, another one for the church. For the church. Uh, so what does the Bible tell us about um, Israel uh, and the relationship with the church? There are several ways to touch on this, to deal with the Israel part. There is, there is one plan of salvation. There is no plan B in the plan of salvation. So no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Um, we, we find in John, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one mode of baptism. Um, it was God's plan for Israel to show to the world the efficacy, the beauty, the goodness of the plan of salvation as demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ. And of course, they failed in that, in that, um, in that mission. But there is not one plan of salvation for the Jew, one plan of salvation for the Gentile. They all come to the Father through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea that uh, God is going to take uh, the church to heaven in the rapture and the Jews are going to be left behind yes. and they're going to go through the big tribulation yeah. and then the, the church that went to heaven is going to come back seven years later with Jesus mm -hmm. to establish uh, a kingdom on earth on for earth. a thousand uh -huh. years. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that dichotomy between Israel and the church really doesn't exist. Yeah, not biblically defensible, not taught in the Bible, uh, and, and, and not one that really stands up under close investigation and close scrutiny. Yeah, you know, I think that the whole confusion concerning the relationship between Israel and the church is in the understanding of the millennium. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and th this yes. is how it goes. Jesus made two promises to his people. He made lots of promises, but two promises with regards to the final destiny of God's people. Yes. He promised, first of all, that um, his people would be taken to heaven. Mm -hmm. John 14, 1 to 3. My father's house, I go to prepare a place. Yes. I will come again and receive you to myself. Mm -hmm. The second promise is that the meek will inherit the earth. Yes. So how can God fulfill uh, both promises of taking his people to heaven and uh, then the meek inheriting the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, those who believe in the rapture, they say there's only one way that you can understand this, and that is that God is going to take uh, the, the church to heaven yes. for uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. That fulfills the first promise, right. taking them to heaven, and then uh, the, he's going to bring them back bring and them the back. meek will inherit the earth. But the Adventist perspective is so much more biblical. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that when Jesus returns for the second time, he's going to take all of the faithful to heaven for a thousand years. Yes. And then after the thousand years, he's going to come and he's going to destroy the wicked, going to cleanse the world, and he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and then the meek will inherit the earth. Yes. It's much more yeah. biblical and makes a lot more sense. That's where I was going, that it's much more biblical, much more logical, much more sequential, it makes much more sense. Uh, uh, as and, and is biblically supportable. The rapture theory is not supportable by the biblical evidence. You can't, you know, you can, you can one take one left and one taken away, but you've got to tap dance so much yeah. to try to fit that in. It just makes no sense. Um, the salvation process is logical, it is sequential, and it is easily understood if you let the Bible explain itself. Mm -hmm. But if you start putting things on top of it, then you've got to, you've got to, gyrate yourself to try to make that stuff fit mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. It, 
in the mind of God, Israel is defined as a people who fulfill the mission for which God created them. Yeah. Now, that's a crucial point. Um, if we believe in God, we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Right. So uh, Israel are the people who do God's will. Right. Um, and in these modern days, we are spiritual Israel. Once you broaden your thinking to, to encompass that and to accept that, then it becomes a lot clearer if you just don't get stuck with Israel being the Israel of old and no one else can ever uh, be classed as Israel. So in other words, the church does not replace Israel. The church continues Israel. Well said. And right? accurate. And biblically yes. accurate. Yes. Uh, let's go to Revelation 12 just for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'll prove that this is uh, exactly the case. Uh, you know, that uh, the church is a continuation of Israel. It is not a replacement for Israel. No. Um, in Revelation 12, um, verse 1, very interesting. Um, I'll just wait for a second till you get there. Here we are. If you want to read verse 1. 12, 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Okay, and then uh, we find in verse 2 that the woman is in, in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Okay, so what does the woman represent here? People say, well, it's Mary. Well, no, it's not Mary because, <laughs> because the child is born and then the woman has to flee to the wilderness for 1260 years. I don't yeah. think Mary has survived that long. No. So, so basically you have this woman and she's with child. Mm -hmm. So the woman exists before the child. Indeed. That's a dumb statement. But the woman exists before the child. No, but it's necessary because of the way theology has just sort of been turned upside on its head. Yeah. Uh, to make The woman exists before the child. The woman gives birth to the child. So the woman exists, bef the church, yes. represented by the woman, exists before the birth of Christ. Precisely. So that's the Old Testament church. Mm -hmm. But then later on, in verse 6, it says that the woman flees to the wilderness mm -hmm. for 1260 days, which represent years. Yes. So... That's the New Testament church. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it, there's only one woman. There's only one woman. The Old Testament church is represented by that woman. The New Testament church that flees mm -hmm. during the papal persecutions mm -hmm. is the same, same woman, woman. The same, same woman. church. Precisely. So that's why I say that uh, we're dealing with continuation As theology. As opposed to replacement. We're not dealing with replacement theology. Exactly. Exactly. Because, well because said. according to the Apostle Paul, a true Israelite, is one who has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, in fact, why don't we read a couple of verses to that effect? You mentioned one of them, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we want to read that because that's really important. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. And um, let's read verse 16, first of all. Galatians 3 and verse 16. All right. You want to read that? Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Okay, so there's only one real seed. There's only one seed. And that real Correct. one seed is Christ. Mm -hmm. However, when the seed falls into the earth and dies, yes. it produces many it produces seeds. Many now, seeds. who are the many seeds? <laughs> Notice verses 28, 26 to 29. Okay. If you want to read those too. Here's 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. Clear as day. Clear as day. So in other words, we are the seed's seed. You are the seed's seed. <laughs> very it's, true. It's kind of like I, I, have a, I have a garden in my backyard, a very small one, because it's a small plot. And I have several tomato plants. Mm. Now that tomato plant came from one seed. Yes. Huge tomato plant mm -hmm. with dozens of tomatoes. Yes. So uh, when Jesus died and was buried and resurrected 
it's like the germination of a seed mm -hmm. that eventually is going to produce many, many seeds. Many, many seeds. So that's why Isaiah said he will see his seed. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be satisfied. And he's going to be satisfied. He's going to sure. be happy about it. Yes. One more verse because time is just about up. Uh, Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Uh, the Apostle Paul makes a very interesting statement. And we need to remember that Paul was a Jew. Oh, yes. He was an Israelite indeed. Mm -hmm. And in verse 20 and 29, Paul says, not everybody who is a Jew is a Jew. Mm -hmm. So what does he say there? <laughs> verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outward, outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, uh, according to the Apostle Paul, yes. the, of the tribe of Be Benjamin, mm -hmm. circumcised the eighth day. A Jew of a Jew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> according to the law, yes. blameless. Blameless, yes. So, so, what is his definition of a Jew? Is it uh, someone who is physically a descendant of Abraham? Or is it someone whose heart has been circumcised, in other words, converted to the Lord Jesus, yes. and is a follower of Jesus? Yeah, this is a very important point, because you get to claim all the promises, because your heart is right with God. Once you've accepted and surrendered and put on Jesus, as it were, then all of those promises made to the Jewish people, to the Jewish line, to the true church, become your promises. And so 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, all of the promises, all of God's promises, mm -hmm. are yes uh, yeah, and amen yes, yes, in Jesus yes. Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So outside of Jesus Christ, we can claim no promise. You can claim no promises. You, and you cannot claim, uh, claim a sonship or kinship or a member of the, the Jewish heritage and all of that, that goes with that if you're not in Christ Jesus. So in short, the church is the continuation of Israel, Amen. not the replacement. Not the replacement. Well, uh, time flies <laughs> when we're having a good time. We uh, apologize about the little glitch at the beginning, but you know, uh, we live in a sinful world, and uh, <laughs> there are occasions when these things happen. I uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, I want to, I want to encourage you to send in your questions, and let me give you the address again: tv at sometv.org. Also, we appreciate your prayers, and we appreciate your financial support. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and we hope that you will join us next time for our program. I'd like to know. God bless.